Hey Coffee Me listeners, welcome to another episode of Coffee Me podcast. I'm so happy that you found time for us today. I have a very special guest. He's a friend of mine. He's from Voyager Coffee, a company which is here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And his name is Samir Shah. Welcome, Samir. Hey, Valerian. I am really excited to talk to you today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. I'm excited myself and I'm happy that you're going to share your coffee wisdom so we can learn and maybe get inspired a little bit in our coffee businesses. Absolutely. I will do my best. Thank you so much. Before we start, I think we should be transparent about the fact that hopefully very soon you are going to teach at Boot Coffee Campus. Right? Yeah, Larian, like education is in Voyager's DNA. We lace that through our company in many ways. Internal stuff, of course, but we also work with the Recovery Cafe in downtown San Jose and volunteer our time to do barista education for people who are not so great a position in life. And I started pitching this idea to you it's like, I feel like a year ago, and I am really excited to be able to share any information that we've picked up over the years. I feel like this community of ours is all about giving back, and I think this is our way to express that. Yeah, and it's you guys did a lot, and what you offering your knowledge is exactly what I miss, especially when it comes to starting a cafe business or coffee shops. Finally, I was looking for this course forever and you just sent me this email. I was like, that's what I need. We have some great trainers at Boot Coffee and I could never convince them to do something similar. So thanks, man. Hey, <laughs> this is going to be, I feel like it's going to be so much fun. When you're talking to people like new blood in the industry, it's all about innovating, getting better and rising the whole industry and lifting it forward. And so this is going to be our tiny little contribution to that. Perfect. Before I hit you with our warm-up question, I just want to say that this place, what you guys see, is my home little lab. And it's a little bit messy because, yeah, it's usually a record from the office. But I think the audio is better here than in office. It's less echo. So let's see. Maybe, maybe, maybe this will be the future of the podcast. So let's roll with it and let me know what you guys think. All right. So my very first question is always a warm-up question. And it's about your first sip of coffee. Do you remember <laughs> your first sip of coffee? I do. Okay. So it was in a different country. I spent my young childhood in India, in Bombay, Mumbai. When I lived there, it was Bombay. So we still call it that. But the coffee I had was in the kitchen of my dad's extended family. So my uncle's grandfather, they all lived in that house, my cousins. And it was Nescafe, instant coffee, with a lot of milk and a lot of jaggery. We use that to sweeten things. It's all the brown sugar with all the molasses. It's totally different than sugar. And so it was jaggery, milk, Nescafe. And can I tell you something? I loved it. I, it was like the greatest thing on earth for me. Of course, that's not like real coffee. Okay, that's coffee for name, but it's not like actual coffee. Okay, so fast forward, I'm in the US. It's the closest I got before I really got into like coffee was Starbucks, those Frappuccinos. The funny thing is, I, we were on a budget always growing up. It wasn't really Starbucks in the store, but it was those Costco bottles of Starbucks, 9.5 ounce Frappuccino bottles. And I remember I really enjoyed those. The really funny thing is my first experience with black coffee and my first falling in love with actual specialty coffee, it, it's hard for some people to believe, but it might have been about eight months before we started Voyager. And that's when I really started appreciating coffee. Went to Ritual, Psych Class, a lot of renowned coffee companies. And my business partner, Lauren Burns, who started Voyager with me, she was the coffee person, and so her goal in life was to get me to be a coffee guy. I think she succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a cool story. Usually people come up with these horror stories. My favorite was recently Bill from Hydrangea Coffee. He mentioned that his first coffee was taking a Nescafe and putting it in his mouth like a powder <laughs> without any water. <laughs> 
And we go like, whoa. <laughs> so that's usually our first experience with coffee. And it's sometimes with a lot of sugar, sometimes with weird stuff like powder. So it's cool. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk to you about the business too. Yeah. So let's first tell us what Voyager Coffee is. Yeah. Craft Coffee was an idea that Lauren and I came up with to do something interesting in our community, in our city of... Uh, so even though I grew up in India, I was born in San Jose. I was three years old when we moved out of here. And then I was 13 when we moved back. So I consider this, I consider this my hometown. And Lauren is from here as well. One interesting phenomenon that we've seen in San Jose is that all of her friends from childhood, what's interesting, Larry, and the people you grew up with, you wonder what they're doing now. And so many of my friends have completely moved out of the area. And they always talked about moving out of the area, even when we were becoming young adults. San Jose was not exciting. It was not innovative. From a tech perspective, it's different, right? But that's really employment and work we're talking. This was from more of a nightlife scene. What is a young person to do here for fun and leisure? And what they always were attracted to is the other cities out there. And so I've seen this like drain of people who are from here who are no longer here. And what we have instead in San Jose is a lot of transplants from other places who are here to work and get a slice of the Silicon Valley pie, that tech pie, really. When that caused an interesting impediment for our city, and as far as its growth goes, we didn't grow like a city like San Francisco or LA, where you have this really strong art scene, and you have this like food and wine scene, and you have like innovation in all these areas, music and all of that, nightlife. We ended up becoming a bit of a boring city, to be quite honest with you. And what our idea was, Lauren and I, we both had different careers at that point, but we just started to observe this, right, firsthand, we heard about it from other people, and she had a background in community work and nonprofit and, and uh, coffee as well, when she was in college, and she's like, you know what, I think coffee would be a great way to bring people together and do something fun and cool. And that's how the idea started. It was, so what is Voyager? It's basically our attempt at bringing community together in the South Bay area. And our, all of our locations are centered around the heart of Silicon Valley. We're all within five miles of each other. There's five locations. We intend to just stay expanding in this area. We don't want to go to the peninsula, Santa Cruz, SF. Santa Clara County is where you want to do it because people here deserve this kind of thing. And it's, it's unique. It's rare. And we're happy to be part of the change that now we're seeing in the South Bay, bringing more cool things to our area. I'm very excited to talk to you also because when you mentioned to me that you have five locations and I looked them up and they look really beautiful. They are really beautiful cafes. And I actually remember when you were guys starting, I came, I was helping Marcus Young, my predecessor at Boot Coffee to do testimonials. And I remember that you guys had, what was it, a three kilo San Francisco? <laughs> It was a it was a garage or a storage oh, kind of place. San Francisco. So basically, you are a garage company, right? That's where we started. Our roots are in really honestly, like like a lot of companies, I think, in our space. We just took a chance on ourselves, and so the San Francisco and three kilos is all we could afford to start off with. And we thought, let's prove the concept. Let's just be committed to doing this at a high level, and it will hopefully get a chance to talk about the cafes and we also started at a very small scale there as well but the power of our world in coffee is that i think of anything right if you do a good job and you get confidence and you get buy-in from people working with you you can really use that as a platform for growth so you started with a roastery first or you had a cart or how did you start it started on the beverage side actually we started as a coffee cart it's interesting because in 20, I kind of want to say late 2015, we were deciding to do a concept with coffee, Lauren and I. Now, we, <laughs> we were coffee outsiders, if I can just be honest with you. I already told you, I never really drank coffee before we started the company. She had never worked in third wave specialty coffee. What we wanted to do was specialty coffee shop. So it was a unique 
position to be in because that's not how most of them start. But what we found was that the cost economics of starting a cafe, a brick and mortar shop, is it's very hard to fathom unless you actually do it. So we go into this one place and we're excited about it. Brick walls and high ceilings and it's got like these metal beams and it's a very industrial but a very modern look at the same time. And we're like, this is perfect. And the guy's talking about some work that has to be done. He's like, oh, you're going to have to fix that. That might be like, oh, he's like, don't worry how much it's going to be. You're going to spend 150 can this anyway. And Lauren and I looked at each other and said, wait, are we? <laughs> how much are we spending on this? Is there extra zero he just added in or something? We, we didn't know that's how the commercial real estate economics work. And we backed away from that. But the idea was still there. So we both went on with our jobs and careers. And one day out of the blue, Lauren calls me and she's, hey, I'm going to buy a trailer. And I was like, cool. We've always talked about going camping in a trailer. And she said, no, but wait, this is going to be a coffee trailer. And so that's what she spent the next five months building out while I was working and making an income. She built, she parked it at my parents' garage in South San Jose, hooked it up to the 220 the washer dryer usually goes into and outfitted the whole thing with an espresso machine, grinder, refrigerator, gray water tank, fresh water tank, electric, all of that. Five months later, we had a coffee cart, coffee trailer. And that's our origin in about mid-2016. Wow. Take me to their logic. So you are having this coffee trailer. It's most likely doing very well. and why did you decide to roast? It's interesting because we our, our trailer involved, of course, we opened a brick and mortar shop at some point late, much later in that year, in 2016. Time passes. We do well at the cafe. So we built a tiny little name brand for ourselves. We're down the street from a really big shop. We're 1.2 miles away from Chromatic Coffee, which is no longer Chromatic Coffee. That is now a different company. But we're down the street from this huge kind of, at that point, the biggest South Bay retail coffee player that's ever been there. And we're like, I don't know how we're going to compete or survive. But we just kept grinding and we made a pretty good name for ourselves. And we got incredibly busy at some point, given the location we had. We decided to learn more about coffee because we were just a multi-roaster model at that point. What I mean is we were buying a lot of coffee from a lot of different roasters, rotating it, serving a single origin from somebody and a regular blend from somebody else and a decaf or a filter from somebody else, right? So that kind of thing. And I, we were enjoying it. But at the same time, we started reading more about coffee, learning more about coffee. And then we took a class at the Boot Academy, actually, Roasting Fundamentals. So I'm going to give a little plug. <laughs> and it was actually Marcus Young who was teaching that class. And we really fell in love with the whole concept of being able to hopefully be a small part of change in how coffee is bought, how relationships are built. And Marcus always said, buy coffee responsibly. I'm paraphrasing, right? I'm summing up a big, bigger point into a small phrase, but in, in that stuck with us. And look, personally, I had no interest in roasting, like physically roasting, right? We had a a couple of people at the company were super interested. So we figured that was a career path for them. And it did turn out to be. Lauren had no interest in physically actually roasting. But we fell in love with the idea of being closer to the farm. And not only that, but like being able to have that pride and quality and standing behind it. And so that's how that genesis of the roastery began. We were a semi-successful cafe. We only had one location. We weren't like a big company or anything. but we were doing decent there. And then we pivoted to starting a roasting operation, as you mentioned, on a tiniest of machines, three kilo San Franciscan. Yeah. So first of all, I'm so sorry I did not know you then better because I would right away tell you that do not buy a three kilo machine. Yes. It's a recurring topic on this podcast that you outgrow it basically in no Yeah, time. you outgrow it in two weeks. <laughs> yep. So that was, especially when you mentioned that you already had coffee shops, that's, that's no brainer. I appreciate that your main motivator was the quality, the fact that you own something, you create something for your cafes. It's 
your hands, not only that you offer other people's coffee, but let's talk also about the core financials. Like how did that change your math and the, or your profitability in these cafes once you started to roast oh, those? Honestly, Valerian, that was one of the toughest things we dealt with because I always tell people who ask me now how they should start a coffee business. People always ask, should I roast? Should I do the cafe? Should I do one or the other first? What I always tell them is try your best to do them both at the same time. And here's why. I think the fundamental reason and really the pain that we felt is that our company model had to change. Like we had to, roasting is a different, okay, clearly you can run a cafe as a business and then you can run a roastery as a business and they can be two independent businesses. But when you do it under one umbrella, now you have a lot of hierarchical lines of communication that might get mixed. People who think they have roles or they're not quite sure what their roles become from an education perspective, from a training perspective, from a roasting perspective, who's higher in the hierarchy. There's politics. There's all kinds of stuff, natural stuff, no bad beef or blood, but like complexities that your business has to now deal with. Now, if you start the roasting component from the beginning and the cafe component from the beginning, you are forced to reckon with those before you really even start the business. And so you can, at a relaxed pace, you're not even open yet, you can really take your time and figure out how you want to set up your company. But when you're in flight and you're adding a brand new component to that plane, it is very difficult to do that. And so we found a challenge, not only in the non-financial part of the world, but can and be honest with you, financially, we, we, we were losing money left and center. You know why? We rented a new space there was a new roaster and we were giving salary to somebody who really was also learning how to roast, right? And so you have all these things, you're just adding cost and money to a problem, which you had a great solution for, which is buying it from people who already know what they're doing. But our eye was always on the long game. Where do we go years from now, not months from now? And we thought that in the long run, okay, yeah, this would be worth it. Of course, I think now we look back and go, great decision. Of course, we would buy a bigger roaster. But outside of that, I think it was a good move. But financially, it was a huge complication for us, to be really honest with you. Oh, interesting. I thought that you would say us that, hey, suddenly our numbers went from red to green. <laughs> no, I think the hard part was like when you add another location, it's the insurance, it's the utilities, it's the electric, it's the internet, it's the cropster, it's the roaster, it's the salary, it's the van you need and the gas and transportation. It's the accounting. It's the legal part of setting up the company. These are the hidden costs behind doing a new location. They're the things that are not sexy to think about or talk about, but they're the ones that add that huge overhead and administrative fee. And also, when you start producing your own coffee, you know, in in you, you know, you want to produce information sheets and you want to produce marketing collateral and you want to do this and that, and all of that takes up time and effort. Now, once it's there. You have a system and process for it. It's beautiful. And once you hit the volume too, of course. But as a one cafe shop, our volume wasn't like huge. And so it was a tough justification, but obviously it worked out for us in the end. The one thing which I love about your experience is that you did it all. You did something which is very basic, like, a, well, basic. Like a lot of people can start with a cart slash a trailer. And you went all the way. I think the recent the new S cafe you said it cost you guys six hundred thousand. The right? new cafe cost but, us six hundred k. Yeah, give or take. Do you remember how much did it cost you to set up the the trailer? And also, what were your revenues? Do you remember? I do. That? I do. I remember that. I remember that like it was today. Okay, so here's the cost. The cost in twenty sixteen dollars. I also did an inflation adjustment cost. The cost in 2016 dollars was about 18,000. Let's just round up to 18,000. But that included everything: the equipment, the trailer. Now, it did not include the permits, so you can add a few hundred or whatever for that. But that's an ongoing cost you're going to have regardless. But as far as the trailer goes, I think we can say 18,000 is the right number. Inflation adjusted, it's about 14,000. And again, that's a trailer on wheels. Now, it's not a food truck, so you still need another car to hitch it to and drive it, okay? But 18000 
for the whole thing, 14,000 in today's dollars. That was the all in cost to operate. Exactly. Sorry, I think I said okay. it backwards. Yeah, I yeah. think I said it backwards. So I th- thank you for catching that. Exactly. That's exactly it. So that was the cost. The revenues were very choppy to start. To be really honest with you, so our first event was April 1st, 2016. It was outside of Kelly Park in San Jose. It was a March of Dimes festival. And it was a fundraiser that Kaiser Permanente has the sponsor for it. We netted $81 that day. 81. And Dan from Denver was our first customer. Not the consumer, because he bought the coffee for his wife, but he was a first customer. And he got a latte. I remember that. That was our first customer. Hey, Dan from Denver. Hey, Dan and Dan's wife from Denver. Hopefully, you're all still together. (laughs) But yeah, that was our first customer. It was $4 latte or $3.50, something like that. But yeah, I I remember the rush of that. I definitely do. And then we had our struggles. That was an $81 a day, right? Obviously, it's it's peanuts. But after that was the real hard part because we had a hard time finding locations to set up at. We, We didn't know how to do that. This is before the world of like really having major digital like ability to just find things. And we also were, as I mentioned, outsiders to a certain extent for coffee. We had even a hard time. If I can tell you this, I'm not going to name names, but we had a hard time even finding people to sell us coffee, like to serve their coffee. Like we called cold calling roasters that we knew or heard of. And yeah, I get it. Like we weren't sure of our own concept. But we told them we're going to really respect it, work well with it, represent it to the best of our ability. Like we're not just going to flounder and give you a bad name. Despite those commitments and kind of those pleas, like we didn't get people to sell us coffee. Finally, like Barefoot Coffee was the one who said yes. And I think like that, we just needed somebody to say, yeah, here's a bag. (laughs) And we used to just go to their warehouse, pick it up ourselves and serve it. But yeah, as far as like the revenue goes, we had a lot of zero dollar sales days. You know? People just didn't know what we were, who we were. But yeah, the key is we persevered. And then eventually we got to the point where we had six events a week, seven events a week. We we're booked all the week. And so it was still challenging running a mobile operation. I don't recommend it unless you really know what you're getting into. That kind of mobility, you can set up coffee carts a lot easier. I think trailers and all of that, it's quite convoluted. But it was the thing that set us up for really our entire future. I think we topped out revenue, just to give you a concrete number. We topped out our revenue in July of 2016. And I recall that number being, let me ask you, what's your guess for our top month for a trailer before we really got into the brick and mortar space? Okay, so is it was it still did it have a certain location? Or no, we uh, moved it around uh, kind of every day. So one okay. day we would be at Mercedes Benz, one day we would be at a wedding catering, one day we were at the Blossom Hill Farmers Market. Yeah, you were doing espressos only and cappuccinos, or did you have some pastry and those things? No pastries, maybe okay. minimal light pastries. We make those in house. We had a cottage kitchen license, so we made our own cookies at that point. And maybe a few other small things we made, brownies and cookies. That was very simple. But mostly we were just doing coffee and espresso drinks. We had a drip machine as well. And we also did some of our like house-made syrup flavored latte drinks. Okay. And seven days? Uh, yeah. I would say we averaged 6.5 that month. Oh, yeah. Okay. My guess is 25, 30K. That's a good guess. Yeah. I think we hit about 18K that month in okay. revenue. Yeah, 18K. That was our best month as a mobile operation. And again, that was 18K in those that money, which the lattes at that point were selling for four bucks. Nowadays, you're like 30% higher as far as that. Yeah, I was thinking of nowadays money, so I should get some credit. You should get credit. I think you get credit. Larian wins the game. So that was actually very good. Now, but that was by far our best month. We had a lot of months where we were in the five to 10,000 range. And it was not a sustainable living, although we both quit our jobs full time and became complete Voyager dedicated professionals. And honestly, if I can just be tell you really quickly, uh, the money was horrible, but the fun we had was irreplaceable. And we got addicted to just that feeling being out there in the community with our people, what we considered our people, our neighbors, our community. 
And I think that became the drug for us to keep going. Yeah, that, that sounds fun. One thing which is missing this from the story is how did you freaking survive when you had these, uh, you gave up your jobs, you did this uh, cart, which sometimes brings money, sometimes not. Yeah. So long story short, we, two components, right? Generosity from our family. Okay. If I can just be honest. Now I can, I think. That was one. And to, they didn't fund the business, but they would help for certain things if we needed it. I'll put it that way. Plus they were just free labor. If I can just be honest, you always want your family backing. That's one of the things that's really important to be a coffee shop entrepreneur. I always talk about that with my people who ask for how to do it. But anyway, we had help from family and friends. That, that was very important. Second thing was that we basically just liquidated all of our other assets. We just Not all, right? But basically if we had stocks or whatever. We were basically living off just residual like earnings and past stuff. Yeah. I love the I love the story about the coffee trailer simply because for a lot of people this is very approachable. They can start a business. It's not too much money. And actually at Boot Coffee we have more and more students who come to the barista class and they are starting a coffee trailer. And I'm like, okay. So if you would give them, let's say, three tips three lessons, what you guys learned doing this, what would they Yeah, do? I think first and foremost, you want to build a financial buffer like how we needed to, because I think not just to survive, but I think the bigger point that I have is, the bigger point I have that is that you need it because like psychologically, you might need it. And there's only so many like <clears throat> really bad sales days that you put like your entire body and mind into still going out there, setting up, you can take while still looking at your bank account and going, wait, what is this business going to turn out to be? So there's that resiliency that you have to like help yourself build by having some kind of cushion and telling yourself, hey, it's going to be okay. I think so having that financial cushion is really important. But I think the bigger point I just mentioned, the right word is resiliency. I think this is actually, if I can be really honest, I always try and, so as a company that now is out there in a public space, very accessible to a lot of people in the South Bay, we get requests all the time. I want to say well over 100, 150, easily, since we've opened. Hey, I want to chat with you about opening my own cafe. And we respond to every single one of them. We don't always meet in person unless I know that they're serious, right? So one of my questions, and I don't ask it directly this way, but I gauge how resilient and how much fire they've got. And that's a good word. I always say you have to have some kind of competitive fire, some resiliency, that you're not going to back down from a challenge, that you're really going to go for it. And that's a very tough thing. Some people either have it and some people don't have it, but I know that I think my life circumstances and growing up areas and places I did allowed me to have that kind of irrational ability to just dream for something. And I think that you have to have a little bit of that. I really do think that resiliency and perseverance is a huge part of it. Call it what you want, but it's all of the things I mentioned. The last thing in this is, often overlooked by people because to be really honest, if people, if I ask people, what are three things you need to do the thing you're telling, asking me for advice on, one of the things they always bring up is I need to know more about coffee. I need to, I really want to be a Q grader so I can learn more about it. And I always applaud that kind of thinking because I'm like, great, you want to keep improving and keeping a better professional, definitely pursue all those goals. But I don't think that's the third most important thing. This is just my personal opinion. My personal opinion is that the third thing you need is really, you need support. You need support in your personal life to do this venture, especially when you're mobile and you're in a trailer or cart setting, because your demand will always be highly unpredictable. There's nothing you can do to smooth it out. And you're always going to need people who are willing to be helpful, get things, buy extra items or ingredients and deliver them to you in the moment, ice, milk whatever it is, right? And unless you really have good support and a foundation system just for your own personal self, 
it's really tough. You either need a partner who's really committed and into it. You need a family, your parents, your siblings, or whatever, nephews, nieces. You need somebody to really be there as your champion. I think, in my opinion, if you have those three ingredients, you're just going to keep going and do it, but you got good support and the money in the next at least couple months, right? If it's not great, it's not going to ruin you. Then I think you've got a pretty good chance at success. I love that you didn't say passion because no. passion is important, but these, what you mentioned, are so much more core than any kind of success, I think. Also, I'm a little bit annoyed about you because you said that it's not important to become a Q grader and you're taking our business away. No, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. That's Actually, you goal. are 100%. That's a great goal. Well, it's, you're 100% right. And it's very important to say, I have students who took almost all the courses, what we have, and they didn't start a company. And I'm like, stop doing I that. Do. I'm happy to take your money. I'm very happy to take your money. But on the other hand, you have to start because if you don't start, you don't even know whether you will really like this whether you are good at yes. this, you don't yes. know that. Yes, you never, uh, yes, I so agree with that. I just want to say that I, that is the statement I would agree with the most. People who, in our company, first of all, four or five of our former baristas have started their own businesses, mostly carts and stuff, but still six probably actually at this point. Okay, and there are about half a dozen more over the years who I have gone up to and said, hey, what are you doing? You." You have talked about this. Have you ever thought about actually doing it instead of just talking about it? There are so many capable people who have what it takes because a lot of people, yeah, I know this passion word gets thrown out all the time, but man, it takes a different kind of person to actually start their own thing. And there are people who have that and they, for whatever reason, I think they choose not to, but they have all the capability to build something very great. Yesterday, I was on a parents' dinner at my son's high school. He's finishing his high school. So there were like a lot of like presentations and speeches and music and dinner. And one person had incredible speed. He was like, I would say the best speech I ever wow. saw. The execution, how he did it, funny, serious combination was incredible. And usually go to these places, okay, there were speeches, we will fall asleep. No, this dude was like incredible. And he said something I was like, even resonated with me. When the people ask you what you do, stop saying, what are you going to do? He said, if you are spending all your time on your phone playing video games, you are a gamer. If you are spending all your time on your phone watching TikTok, you are a TikTok yeah. watcher. You are not doing anything else with your life. Yeah. Are you happy with it? You have to answer that. There is no judgment there. But stop saying what are you going to do or what are you going to be? Say, what are you right now in this moment? I was like, damn, there's so much in that's that. That's very deep, right? Yeah. It's very deep. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. So you said the resilience is very important. And I could see that because you guys, despite like a bumpy ride with that trailer, pun intended. <laughs> I always thought I'm going to kill somebody on the freeway. I like, I always thought somebody's going to die on the freeway because that trailer, it had so much water in it. It would slosh around left. The whole trailer, you could see it in your rearview mirror. I'm like, oh my God, someone's going to die today. But nobody did. So thank goodness. <laughs> I meant more financially. Or hey, that's true. Like that, tough... that too. Okay. <laughs> I really thought we were going to murder somebody. <laughs> but you guys decided to go for the cafe. Yeah, so I just want to... Ha- see that thought process that, hey, this is very hard doing the trailer and now let's open a brick and mortar. What was the thought process? And do you remember how much you spent? I do, I do. I know exactly what we spent. Yeah. And I know exactly the thought process. And I remember the conversation as well, because it was after the Blossom Hill Farmer's Market, which happens on a Sunday. And so it was about Sunday, 1.30 PM. We were driving on 85, going back to my parents' home, because that's where we parked the trailer. And we... It was actually a few days or a week after I had this horrible case of vertigo because I was all day in the sun and it was just one of those brutal kind of mobile days. And we were just looking at each other thinking, oof, we gave up like our W-2 careers for this, paychecks for this. And we're loving it. Like that's not really not saying it was a bad experience at all. In fact, it was the most special experience. But financially, we're just like, Hey, like, how do we scale this up? If our ceiling is like 18,000, 15,000 a month, 
we have two incomes we have to support in Silicon Valley. And how do we do that going forward? Do we, how do we have a life with this? And so the conversation was really sobering because we feel like we had proven our concept, but now we were thinking in different terms. It was exciting too, right? It's like, it's not just all down. Like, yeah, making it seem like it was a horrible violins in the background conversation. No, it was just a realistic conversation about what do we do. And I really think we were just like, okay, do we have a fleet of these and we hire people to run one and run one and we run one or whatever? And that was an idea. I think, I think that is a viable idea, first of all. That is a, someone's going to do it one day and it's going to be great. The other thought was, hey, should we stabilize, just open a brick and mortar store and actually now see exactly what we're made out of? Proving yourself in the mobile world is really hard. And then I, we also felt like proving yourself in the brick and mortar world would be really hard too. Now, one's not harder than the other. They're just both hard. But we were just ready for that challenge. And we thought we'll still run our trailer while the brick and mortar is up and running. And we did. We successfully ran the trailer for one more year. We actually did really well because we were more picky about the events we said yes to. We All those $0 sales days were gone. And so it became a really cool part of our business. But the idea behind starting it was to give ourselves a platform and a stability to then maybe have uh, a greater financial sense of cushion for our personal lives. And maybe this is a story for another day. Maybe it's a story for today, but it was anything but that. My goodness, it's expensive running a cafe. And then expansion is so much more expensive. But anyway, if you can do it and you can sustain yourself and build a successful and stable business, at some point it's going to be worth it. And we're still waiting for that point, by the way. But, but we're on our way. The, the, but as far as answering your question directly, there was a coffee company in the South Bay. Most people don't know about this one anymore because the last outlet that they had closed in 2018. And it wasn't even called the name of the cafe that we occupied. It was called Bolano Coffee. Bolano Coffee. And they were a, a family that started this coffee business and did well. They were like the first barefoot, right? The OG barefoot, pre-chromatic, Bolano were the first two specialty coffee players in the South Bay. And Bolano was a Verve coffee wholesale account. So they learned a lot from Verve and the way they blew up in the 20. 2000, whatever, 10 to 15 space. They took on some investor money and just became this huge company, right? And so I think Bolano wanted to mimic that model. They might have re overexpanded by a little bit. Hope I'm not oversharing things. It's all history. It's not nothing negative. They did a great job. I think they just ran out of steam. And their misfortune was our really good luck. And I have to say any success we have, I always mention them because they're without their old cafe, who knows what our story would have been. Maybe not as good. Okay. So I always paying homage to them a little bit right now, but they had this cafe that had been operating for 11 years and they were like, Hey, if you just take over the lease and buy the equipment, you can have it. And yeah, your eyes light up because Valerian, like that is unheard of a successful third wave shop that's willing to just sell you equipment at the used equipment prices. And now you can take it over for their lease, basically. That's what we did. And the total cost was about including broker fees and tax, a few other components go into it, right? But all in cost, 55K. But that included a three-group machine, four grinders, drip, four fridges, I think an oven, furniture, basically everything right open close basically that you got a gift got you basically got a free gift we did we got a free gift because we needed that equipment anyway so people always say 55k but i'm like that's just the equipment cost if you break down the equipment cost yeah. that's what it comes out to okay maybe we overpaid by eight thousand or something right but whatever it's a free gift let's just our they didn't have a water filtration but they had a few other they had a bunch of components grease trap everything was built in plumbing three compartment sink all of that so what we did is we signed the lease in mid-August or early August. And then we took the next six weeks to do a DIY remodel, like total DIY. We did the woodwork and the, the you know, 
live edge tables ourselves. We sourced stuff from like this junkyard, secondhand pool industrial junkyard up in San Francisco in the dog patch area. Uh, we scoured like a bunch of like metal recycling sites for stuff. We can like old windows, which were broken out so we can do flower beds in there and stuff. It was all DIY, but we spent maybe an additional, I want to say 15000 on that. Our countertops we redid, little things like that. We wanted to give the space our own look. And so for about 70K, but really it, we could have bargained down to 50K just for the sales price and we didn't have to do the remodel. So in that 50 to 70 range is what we got this ready-made shop for. And I mean ready-made because customers were coming in even while we were remodeling, right? Like thinking it's open. And so when we opened, it was like great for the community and neighborhood because they're like, oh, cool, new shop, but it's kind of like the old shop because we knew it. Like we just had momentum, a little bit of momentum pre-built already. Cool. But so what were actually the revenues of the shop when you bought it? Yeah. Were they in a positive numbers, yeah. the profitability? And where did you take yeah. it? Yeah, we took it to really big heights. And I don't want to... I really don't want to give their, let's just say we quadrupled their revenue in, in about 15 months, we quadrupled it, 18 months. It was one, two, three, four times their average monthly revenue. I just think that we were at that point in our lives, you know, Valerian, where, man, we were just on fire. Like we just wanted to go for it. And I'll be honest with you. We had chromatic down the street. And I was like, I want to be busier than Chromatic. That was my goal. Like I told my team when we first started, and I tell myself this all the time now, I didn't do this to come in second place. I wanted to be like, I wanted to do a good job. And this is not me patting myself on the back because I, I'm telling you this right now. Once you hire employees, once you start serving the community, if you still think it's about you, like I think you're in the wrong line of business. It is about everything else that leads to your support. And we had the right mix of our good team. We had good values as a company. So we hired against those values, good people, we bought in, and we got great support from the community. We, States Coffee and Martinez sur surpassed us. But until they surpassed us about six months ago, we had the most five-star ratings on Yelp, like without dropping to four and a half. We had 791 reviews on Yelp, five-star rating at that OG spot. And States is now like in the 850 range. So kudos to them. But we hit that number in two years. We were just on fire. It just worked. It was a right mix of everything for us. And we feel fortunate. Of course, we had Bellano to kick us off. We had a great team. But man, we just did not want to be denied. And we just kept going. So we started hitting like six figure plus numbers in, in that year and a half. Yeah. Wow, that's super impressive. So you are now on fire and you decide that, yeah, we want to do this and we want to do more of it. So you go for more cafes. And as far as I understand, they were more sophisticated, bigger. First of all, like, where do you get the energy for that? <laughs> and second of all, how did you finance it? Oh, so Valeria, can I ask you something? Have you ever heard that phrase? In my psychology class, I heard this phrase, you are your parents, something along those lines. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I think both Lauren's mother, my parents were very, like, they had that, like, DNA of just going at all cost, even if it means sacrificing personal, physical, and mental stability. And so we had that DNA from our parents, honestly, literal DNA from our parents. I can, so that was part of why we had this insatiable appetite not to expand but to do well i just want to make clear that those are two different things i think expansion and having your eye on expansion only is can be really troublesome because then you can find yourself in trouble and over expand and do all kinds of not great things but we just wanted to do well and when we proved our concept for that first shop I remember Lauren and I having discussions because she was on the other side of that spectrum thinking, I don't think we need to expand. And I was thinking, hey, Lauren, like the landscape can change. Blue Bottle can open down the street, which they eventually did at Santana Row. I didn't even know it at the time. 
I was like, but other coffee companies can come into the area, which they did. Somebody opened like a block and a half from us, you know, a local uh, company. And like, you have to be resilient to weather all those things. And expansion is one way you can do that a little bit. And so, yeah, we decided to embark on that journey to open second shop. And that same year we opened the second shop, we started roasting also in-house. So that's 2019 is when we opened our second shop and started roasting. And of course, we all know the year after that, really six months after we did both those things, COVID happened. But, but yeah, that was like that, that the journey to expand was a difficult one, but I think it was needed because you can't, you can become stale as a brand very easily if you don't have an eye towards like growth and have that growth mindset. It doesn't always mean you open more retail locations, but you have to innovate and you also have to open opportunities for your team. For us, expansion was a great way for us to promote awesome members of our team who then became our lead roaster, who then became our cafe one manager, our cafe two manager, our cafe three manager. We had all these people working at our shop when Lauren and I were in there every single day. And so by expanding, we gave them the opportunity to replace our roles. And I think that was a really cool part of it too. How did you finance it? Self-funded 100%. There is zero debt financing. By that, I mean loans. There is zero investor money. By that, angel investors or whatever it is. It was all just done by the earnings out of the first shop became the second shop and then that became the third shop and then all of that became the fourth shop so our cafes have gotten increasingly expensive to build because we basically just put every single thing back in them <laughs> we didn't pay ourselves for the first five years and we just put it all back in the business fascinating i did not know that so there was no elon calling you hey here's oh we had people come into our cafe all the time who would uh, say, hey, I've got money and I would love to invest some money into your business. Like this dentist was like, hey, if you ever need 25,000, I got it. Or this guy who's, hey, I really want to put a significant amount of money into your business. And I'm just like, no, I don't know what to do with that. And I really don't want to answer to somebody else either. So we always declined all those offers. And we've had offers from like really big people also. I can't name them, but they're like in the billionaire kind of net worth range because they're just customers, right? I'm sure they offer other coffee shops too. I'm not saying like we're some kind of exclusive unicorn, but like people come in all the time saying we want to put money into your business. We've never gone down that route. I just don't know what it would look like. Dude, you know what? I don't want anybody else on the table with me. I really don't. Unless it's my, it's unless it's my team. You know, yeah, you my grow. team can tell me everything they want to do, but nobody else. So I think it's a good decision. I was just surprised. Do you think it's a Bay Area thing yeah. that we have all these? Yeah, okay. thing. So it's, if you are in Cincinnati, Ohio, yeah. the people most likely will not come. Oh, no, think about it. Actually, there was a big article written in the 20, what, 12, 13 kind of Wall Street Journal, maybe New York Times. There's a big article about how the hottest investment is in coffee. Of course, you had Phil's and Blue Bottle, which are local companies, right? Bay Area, local. But then you had other companies also not quite as big who got funded, like Verve got funded. Ritual, not ritual. I don't know about them. Side class, I know, got funded. Huge Stop claims, them. right? I want to continue this topic because recently I interviewed Cafe Substance in France, and they are famous about offering substance, meaning basic coffee. Basic by meaning like high specialty grade coffees, but they do not offer pastries. They do not offer any distraction, no music, no Wi Fi. The place is very much like a sushi bar. Actually, that's, and the person himself, the Joachim and his lovely wife, Alexandrine, they are the showmen. They don't have any baristas, and he explains the coffees. And it's a very unique feel. Cool. They do some cappuccinos, as far as I understand, because he says that milk and coffee actually can work. And, I, and my question to them was, hey, I guess, how do you make money without all the extras? So you, as experienced coffee shop, now chain owner, how do you see the ratio of sales when it comes to, let's say, the coffee beverages, the sweet coffee beverages, specialty drinks, pastries, merch, etc. I love that question because now you're getting to the point of really thinking about your sales mix and like what the margins are for each of these items. So 
what's interesting about our company is that we do, of course, we do coffee and we roast the coffee as well. So, okay, that's a given. But we also we also bake everything in house. We just started that about we started that two months after the pandemic. We had somebody who really wanted to bake for us, and uh, we said, okay, let's do it. Let's experiment. We treated really COVID as any other year from a business strategy standpoint. We continued just going all into our business. So we opened our third shop in 2020, and we also started baking in-house in 2020. And of course, we opened the fourth one in 2022. So now we bake thousands of pastries a week, many thousands a week, just for our own internal consumption. We don't do wholesaling for that. Your personal consumption? Pers personal consumption at our cafes. My, your, oh, yeah. Your my, personal consumption. Yeah, if I pan to the fridge, you'll see them all. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could eat them now, but I, as I get older, you white hair, I, I find that it's hard to metabolize all that. <laughs> but yeah, so 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 at this point now pastries. And the many, actually, it's, I think it's even more than that now. And, and the, you mentioned pastries. It's such an interesting topic. You are, as a coffee shop, never going to make a lot of money off pastries. Unless you're a bakery who's doing, caf who's doing coffee. So you can be a coffee shop doing baked goods, or you can do be a bakery doing coffee. Every coffee shop is a bakery, except for the Substance Cafe in Paris. Hats off to them. And every bakery is also a cafe. 99.9% .9 of them, right? It's just the ratio of the sales and the focus that they have from a display perspective and everything that's always different. Now, the reason I say as a coffee shop, a cafe or a coffee-focused cafe, you're never going to make money on pastries is because you'll always, you'll never be able to order the right mix. What I mean by that is if you don't want to run out four hours before you close, you, you just don't want to do that because it's disappointing for customers. So you always order a little bit more, but a little bit more on a bad weather day or a slow day can turn out to be a lot more. Now, some stuff like croissants, you don't want to save for day two because again, you're going to disappoint somebody who has that, right? You could sell it, but I mean, they may not come back and buy it. So you're, that's wastage. And if you are buying your croissant from, let's say, uh, I'll give you real numbers. All right. So this is, write it down if you're listening. But a wholesale, high level croissant. I'm not talking like medium, whatever, off the road, right? Yeah, a good croissant, which like in France, people would appreciate. You're going to buy that from a reputable baker for about $3.25. Depending on if it's just butter croissant, it could be 280. But if it's like chocolate almond or something, you could be like 380 or four dollars. Ham and cheese, it could be like 425. That's your cost. You cannot sell that four dollar croissant for nine dollars, right? It just <laughs> that math doesn't work. You're gonna have to sell that at market price, which is gonna be in the six to seven range at most, right? Beyond that, it's crazy. So don't even try. So you're making out of each one of these things like at most two bucks, but there's effort in ordering in the administrative side of it and putting them out in the pastry case. Your pastry case alone, if it's a good glass one, probably costs you $4,000. So you have to pay that back too. There's the, then you, there's the wastage, which takes away from all of that money, right? And so as a coffee shop who doesn't bake their own stuff in house, it's real hard to make any real money out of pastries. But every coffee shop does it. You know why? Because if you don't, people won't come to you. So you're going with this really low margin product to attract people to do your high margin stuff. That spoke model, right? Basically, like you're getting people in for something, but then you're using the spokes to make more money on other things, which is your coffee and your coffee bag sales and things like that. So that's the reality of the economics of doing pastries. It's really hard unless you do it and control it in house. And now that we control that in-house, it's beautiful. But let me tell you something. It's very hard because I mentioned earlier that a cafe is a different business. A roastery is another business. Believe me, a bakery is a whole other business. And you do not want to do that unless you are very wide-eyed about what you're getting into. You need different skill sets. You need completely different ways of thinking. It is very incompatible with being a good coffee shop owner to be a good bakery owner. You really have to know what you're doing. And that is a very hard thing to do. We pulled it off. And so hats off to us, to be honest, and our team of bakers and Lauren, who oversees it, and Stephanie, our head baker. These guys have put in the work to make this happen. But now that it's there, it is beautiful. And I think we can, we have a dominant advantage 
not just locally, like there are very few cafes who roast, do brewing service in cafe and bake as well as we do in house that I've ever seen in my life. And so it's a great advantage, but the real economics to answer your question directly are horrible on pastries. I will add one more nuance, which you didn't ask about, but I'll mention it anyway. There's also a food components, which a lot of cafes are getting into now. By that, I don't know, bagels, waffles, toasts. Those are great. But again, the margins on those are slim because the labor involved in making everything is tough. The equipment you need, the equipment breakdowns, the inventory space you need, the administrative costs on managing that whole thing, training to do it at a high level or high volume, all of those are hard. We've been able to figure it out. So again, it's great now for us, but the first few years were horrible. So all these things like takes really high level of focus and commitment to do at a high level. But like I always tell people, as good as like our reputation is as a coffee shop, I want that same reputation to be for our roastery, for our bakery, for anything we serve. So yeah, it's a long answer, but I hope the point comes across. Yeah, so thank you for opening up about this and being honest about numbers because that always helps people thinking so the coffee business or coffee shop, what does it entail? We always think that pastries are a big part of it and big profit, but it seems not. I assume that now as you produce them yourself, the cost per croissant are much, much lower. As a baker, I know that it costs almost nothing to make a croissant, what? but obviously you have to hire people to make it because it's not you at home making it in order to make financial sense you have to have a volume of these pastries be sold and as a non-bakery you need at least few cafes to spread them around right at what point do you think that a coffee shop should start to think that hey maybe we should make these in i really think it comes down to what kind of company you want to be and so i think that is a great question because I think there is an answer that I can give that's a little more direct. But before I give the direct answer, I want to give the real answer because to be quite honest, any company can bake in-house when they start. In fact, our first two months of Voyager in 2016, once we opened on Stevens Creek, what we internally call our OG shop, we did bake in-house in literally in our house. We got a cottage kitchen license so the county would allow us to make it ourselves And every morning at 6 a.m. when we rolled in, because we were there 365 days a year the first few years, we would bring the pastries with us. It was a horrible model, completely unsustainable, and crazy to even think you could do. And my goodness, I'm so glad we ditched it a few months, maybe six months in or so. But the point is, you could do that off the at the very start if you wanted. You could build that complexity in for yourself. But do us all a favor and don't, you know, because... I want all these would-be entrepreneurs to actually be successful and not get burned out the third week of operation. So go easy on yourselves and bite off what you can chew. But the, the if it, for us, the reason why we really were motivated to do it is <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story that's it's not many people even internally know. But okay, so a few months after we started baking, this random person customer right this lady walked in she's like hey i know you've got your own pastries but i'm a trained baking professional professionally like academically studied it like cardan blue or something right but i had kids and so i took a break but i'd love to bake for you guys out of my home kitchen our model but she would do it and we're like yeah let's do it paulina and so she became our baker and when the pandemic hit she, we had a really like emotional meeting and she's like, hey, I got to walk away from my business. But if there's a way I can bake for you guys, I really would love to. And I said, no, oh, Paulina, we're opening a third cafe. It's a former Starbucks, actually. They closed. And we're going to occupy it. And they've got a decent sized like space in the back. I don't know. Starbucks got always plans for the Armageddon. So there's, you're paying for all the storage in the back. You never need. It's like a big warehouse. I said, what if we put some baking equipment back there? You come on as an employee, bake for us. She's like, when do I start? That's our story for how we started baking. It was because we were working with somebody who shared the values we did as a company, who we really liked, 
And we are all about promoting internally and making it for what things our team wants to do. This was crazy. This was ambitious. This made no sense, which is why all the reasons why we did it. <laughs> so we just, it was another big sh- moonshot we took, which is, okay, if it works, we're going to look really good. If it doesn't work, okay, we'll probably still live. But I think you've awesome. got to have at least, if you're not consuming internally, selling 2,500 pastries a week, don't even bother. Yeah. Don't even bother. I have the last question about margins and sales in a cafe because I could do this forever, by the way. I would have a giziness of questions, but I think we going to be together many times during those courses at Boot Coffee. So I'm sure that when people will be shy, have no questions, I'll be the yeah, one. These are fun topics. <laughs> yeah. If you go to other cafes and look around, what do you think that most often they miss out on? That let's say you say, hey guys, you should have this because there are great margins on this and you are missing out on that. What would that be? Yeah. Now we're talking specifically what they're missing out from an economics revenue perspective. Yeah, so they don't have it in their coffee shop and they should. I tell you what, I will, I think this really helped us as a business. And I see more of it now, which makes me happy, but I still don't see enough of it. At least I don't see the right level of this in the marketplace. I think it's allowed us to stand out. I don't know why no one's really looked at our model and said, oh, I really want to do this too, because look at where it's brought us. So here's what I'll say. Having well-crafted, That is the key phrase. I just want to make that clear. Please don't forget that phrase when I say the rest of it. Crafted flavored drinks in your your cafe. And I think, forget about what I said. Let's focus on well-crafted. What does that mean at Voyager? It means we house make every single syrup that someone's consuming. We're not buying a bottle from our friends at the road at Tarani. We're not buying Monin. We're not buying holy cacao. We're not buying the chocolate sauce. We're not buying the vanilla syrup. We're not buying the simple syrup. We're making all of that in-house. That's what I mean by well-crafted. I promise you, like, it's still going to taste good if you buy Tarani. But I also promise you that as a company, you won't have the same level of pride. And when you talk about it with customers and when your team talks about it, that will come across. Especially as you expand. Having that internal like pride in what you serve, that care for quality, that, that pride in quality, that care for coffee, those come when you start doing those things in, internally. And for us, it's been a game changer because we've been able to do innovative syrups like reduced bourbon. You can't, yeah, you could buy that, but there's making it ourselves, like having the ability to do that in-house is so cool because we can talk about it, how we make it, right? Our simple syrup is not just a simple syrup. We do it a special, different way. It completely stands out from what else is out there. The way we sweeten things, the measurements and proportions we use, we can dictate all of that because we made the whole recipe. And we've never in our existence copied a drink from somebody else. I'm not saying that drink hasn't been done somewhere in the world, but like I'm saying we did not copy it from them. We have come up with all of these in-house. Our baristas have come up with all of them the past four or five years. We rotate every few months. It keeps things interesting and new. And frankly, if you, again, it's all about the kind of company you want to be and catering to the audience in the way you want to. San Jose is a Starbucks town. Like we, including all the Target Starbucks and the ones at the airport and all that, there were like 91 Starbucks at one point in our city. It was like per capita, one of the top 10 in the world. So my point is, you've got people like my parents, right? First generation immigrants who don't really know how to appreciate coffee, but they know that they like their vanilla latte, right? And like at some point, we can just say, hey, you're either going to have this eight drink menu that's like perfectly crafted, curated by us, or we can say, hey, we can do those eight drinks really well too, better, as good as everybody else. But here's four other drinks that are going to knock your socks off that are like completely revolutionary. And yeah, there's some flavor and sweetness in them, but it's going to make you think about different culinary things and take you on an adventure, take you on a journey, take you on a voyage. That's why Voyager is our name. And so that really is one thing every cafe needs to lean into 
because this next wave of customers, you've already got all your hardcore coffee drinkers. The especially coffee market is saturated enough at this point. You can get a good cup of coffee in a lot of cities and a lot of neighborhoods. But what you really need to do to stand out is, well, you need to stand out in a way. And this is one way to do that. Do you have an end goal with Voyager? Do you have something like, hey, I want to achieve this, and then I just sit back and watch with popcorn and stuff? Or is it something which on a daily basis changing? No, I don't think it'll be the sitting back and watching with popcorn. But and it's tempting, though. I pop one <laughs> in a cup of coffee. I, we're actually going to be rolling out a survey to our staff tomorrow. And I've talked to some of the teams already, but I've told them that this is a, their opportunity to tell us what they want to do next. For me and for Lauren, we've written a lot of great chapters in our book. And I think we've built a company that, you know, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do, but I think it's somewhat sustainable now. And I really couldn't say that the first six years. I really couldn't. We had a real hard time thinking if we we're going to be like long-term viable. But I think we're at that threshold where we've achieved enough scale. We do enough things in-house. We're now building extra capacity at our roastery to roast unlimited amounts of coffee. We can bake crazy amounts of stuff. I think we've got like a good thing going. But I mentioned something earlier, like for us, growth and expansion is never like a goal. It's a byproduct of things we want to do. So if there is a lot of interest for people to do certain things, get into roasting, get into training, or get into baking, those are the things we're going to lean into in our next phase. I don't have a definitive growth plan for us. I'm not one of those cafes that's, oh yeah, let's open 20 of these. I'm like, I don't even know what that company looks like at that point. And you don't either. You're just saying that. What does that even mean? You're totally different. You're a corporation at that point. You're not a company. You're incorporated. And you have stock and things like that. It's totally different game. We don't want to ever get to that point, but we know that we want to grow within Santa Clara County. And if that means adding a few extra locations, great. That fits into our model and doesn't factor our values, then we're all for it. But like that always comes first. And then listening to our team and what they want to do. So to answer your question, I think I'll find out in about a week once I read all the survey results. I wish I now did a podcast a week later. Now it's cool. I'm sure we can share that some way. I have the last two questions here for you. One is a recurring question. I love to ask it because a good entrepreneur gets really creative with that. And it's my $10,000 question. And I started to ask this question eight years ago. I just realized this month I'm celebrating eight years of the podcast. Wow. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Wow. So, I know there's inflation money involved, so maybe this 10,000 would be now, let's say, 13,000. But let's go with that 10,000 dish territory. If I would give you $10,000, what kind of, and I ask you, hey, start a coffee business, what would you do with that money? I'm start? saying in six years, you can build what we have now, because that is exactly what we started with. Let's not get lost over 2,000 here or there. Yeah, we built a trailer instead of a cart. If we did a cart, we could have done it for less than 10,000. Okay, so the only reason it cost us more is because it had wheels. Now, that had downsides as well. So a, a cart is a perfectly great way to start, and you can do that for 10K. Get a GS3 or a Linea Mini or whatever, a Kony or a Super Jolly, okay, a rinser, gray water tank, fresh water tank, and one of those Husky desks. You could do it. All right, here's the real, here's a real answer. If you're the same things I mentioned earlier, right? Yeah, I really come back to those. It's this intangible stuff that really matters in our line of work. But if you've got good support, and if you're willing to just see it through, that's funny you asked me that question because that is like exactly what our start was. And from then on, everything was just self-funded. Well, we never took on any money. So for $10,000, we now have four cafes. The fifth one, of course, it's attached to the roastery. A roasting operation, a baking operation, a catering arm. We have all of this in six and a half years, basically. And the cool thing is that we can go anywhere from here as a company. We're not tied into any one thing. And so 
I always, one of the things, I love writing. So I write about just personal stuff. I share a lot of writings with my team, the monthly newsletters and things like that. But one topic I feel is really underrated, Valerian, is you have to learn how to dream recklessly. And so that 10,000 is a drop in the bucket for what it can compound into. Because like for us, it's been quite a journey. And I'm not saying like this is the right model to do it. I'm just saying we're like one of many examples of success that didn't start with a huge investment up front. Some people can definitely do that huge investment. And I think that's a wonderful way to start too. But I just don't want people to get discouraged when they think, oh, I don't have anything and where can I go? Because you can really go places with very little. I love that. I think you're going to be an excellent trainer because I think part and I think part of my job as a trainer is always motivating and inspiring people. And also, of course, teaching them about coffee. But when you leave the lab inspired for me, it's always like the best thing. Even better if you put good or bad espressos or if you're a good or bad roaster. The fact that you're inspired to go further and learn more, it's always the best. I liked what you said about compounding. And that word compound, it's so freaking important in the whole life. Because... I started my company, Green Plantation, in Europe 12 years ago-ish. We were the first specialty coffee company, and we spent 8,000 euros on the company. That's why I have the $10,000 question. So it is possible to start. And we bought our Turkish roaster, very crappy, $3,600, 5 kilo, which actually can roast only 3.5, 4 kilos. We bought our first pallet of coffee, and we started. And we didn't even roast it that much. Our company was selling like maybe six to seven tons of coffee a year, which for many companies here, it's a joke. Like it's nothing. But what did compounding brought? It brought that that year seven. First of all, it was a lot of fun. We spent most of our first money for Aeropress Championship, like sponsoring first Slovak Aeropress Championship, stuff like that. We actually didn't take almost any money out. But then the last three years, I was taking like around 1,000 euros every month as a dividend, which is it's good, right? Again, not selling that much coffee. And not only that, but we sold the company end of last year, beginning this year. And yeah, we cashed in some money. We actually bought our own real estate, which I bought my partner. Of. So I ended up with a beautiful real estate in my town, which I love. There's a sourdough bakery right now. It's amazing. And I got some money from it. Again, not that much coffee, but the compounding and time is the important part here. Because if we would bail out in year five or six, we would go just really sour. We would go, oh, this didn't work out. Because we were not in red. We always made some profit, but it, it was just like, oh, I'm making a lot of money here. It's just never the same. And we did so many mistakes. Dude, you will not even believe. If we did it correctly with the knowledge I know today, the sky is a limit. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it's the, the compared compounding is very yeah. important here. Yeah. yeah. I tortured you here for almost one and a half hour. So I just, it's just fair that I give you the chance to ask me a question. I love this podcast because it's entrepreneur focused and it's with other, other entrepreneurs and you yourself are, now, are an entrepreneur. The conversations can get really rich and real. So I love that. But in all those conversations, I'm curious, like eight years of doing this, which is incredible, but what are some common themes that you picked up over the years? Or maybe even, you can even just say, since like post COVID to keep, give it a, a shorter time frame, I'm curious, like if there's anything that jumps out as like themes people are thinking about doing or more people are getting into or the way people are thinking about doing their business. I don't know. I'm really curious about that answer. Oh boy. I should ask these questions ahead. <laughs> I always put myself on a spot, which I enjoy too, because it gives you the answer from my gut, right? So what I see is two things what's happening, and it's not really through the podcast, it's actually through my students at Boot Coffee. I teach the roasting business class, which is basically the roasting cousin of hopefully your class coming soon. And I see two things. One is that a lot of people are interested in these high specialty coffees. And that's why my past few interviews and on this podcast were actually about hey, how you treat these. Are these, I call them PR coffees because they give you, hey, this person has this very expensive coffee. So a lot of people talk about it. 
but that's slowly vanishing because we're getting used to this, right? So now it's time to make business with them. And I always ask these companies, hey, how do you make business with them? Are they profitable? So far, everybody who answered me that they are not. Oh, wow. <laughs> that I just think of passion. And I know you guys have some of these, so of maybe you have a feeling about that. And the second thing that I see that we're filling up courses for coffee shops more. And people dream about coffee carts. Three people really want to do something where they communicate with the community yeah. and doing it with coffee is easy because we like coffee. We find coffee as a piece of conversation. You sit down with your friend for a cup of coffee or a cup of wine, but in, in the United States, doing anything with wine is very hard because of alcohol permits and you're Tell crazy. Yeah, you know, I know. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but the coffee is much easier approachable. And I'm surprised because when Marcus, my predecessor, was doing these, I had a feeling that everybody wanted to roast. And it's still true, a lot of people want to roast. But the amount of people, especially the past year, who come to the barista course is like, hey, I want to open a coffee shop. And they get a little bit disappointed because you don't cover business concepts. That's why, again, I know I'm plugging you like crazy, but that's why I think that your pitch came in a right time. Yeah. I was like, oh, I want to help these people out. This is great. You know, what's interesting is I have seen the market shift the same way. I rarely, anyone now will talk about, I want to learn how to roast. I think, you no, know, they still talk about it. I don't want to say that, especially a lot of our team. But there are so many outside email inquiries, at least 15 to 20 a month. It's crazy. One day I got four or five notes, four to five different people want to open their own coffee shop. In fact, I was just exchanging texts with somebody 10 p.m. yesterday who was asking about, what do you think about this space? She's a tech person who wants to move away from it and open her own cafe. She's very serious about it. I'm sure she will in the next year. But it's remarkable how much interest there is on that now. Okay, that's great. And then I, my second question is, from a European perspective, yeah, like, aside from the coffee, because like obviously Western coffee is very latte heavy and milk based and all that, but Western as in like U.S. and North America, I should say, we're very twenty ounce sizes and all that nonsense. But I'm curious, like intangibly, like what are the main differences between the Europe coffee model and, and our maybe our American coffee model? Oh boy, depends what world are looking into because you can look into the specialty, specialty. world yeah. and you can look. Okay, I think. That in Europe, we definitely drink more straight beverages like espresso. And espresso is always the king, like no matter what. Filter coffee here in the United States is more popular. Yeah, specialty places in Europe will have filter. And actually, I became a very big fan of filter coffee, like pour overs. I think they open up better. I think I can experience the flavors much more widely compared to espresso. Yeah. That's one thing. Second thing is a roast level. I think that in Europe, they do super lights. In a way that, as a roaster, I disagree with that. And I'm not talking about medium and light roast. The light roast is very yeah, light. Yeah, especially some of the Nordic countries. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I have this discussion a few times with, with these roasters. They like to highlight the acidity. And I'm like, I like to highlight the acidity too, but I like when it comes with sweetness and balance. And there's a very tight window when you can achieve that on a coffee. And it's not a rocket science. Everybody can learn how to do it. So it's not like, oh, only I can do it. It's, but... You have to nail it there. And then what Europeans many times, or the specialty world doesn't understand that it's if everybody will roast the coffee the same way, then we are going to have a very boring world. The f exact same thing what we criticized on Starbucks, that, hey, they're roasting dark, ha, 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 everybody roasting dark pizza and Starbucks, and it's boring. We're doing the same with a light roast yeah. in Europe. In the United States, I can see that some roasters do light, some do go towards yeah. medium, medium. So it's, there's a little bit bigger variety. And I understand that light roast lover will hate the company which go medium, but that's okay because not everybody will love you, right? So it's like you cannot please everyone. And there will be people like the medium roast and they're like, I don't want to go that light. So in Europe, it's more like really like tight. And there's no even conversation about that. I still have stakes in a green plantation. I sold it. I still own 10%. And many times I discuss it with the roaster there. I said, hey, man, to learn to roast is not just hitting the same profile and the same rose degree. There's a lot of shades and you have to explore them. You understand. You have to communicate why you roast it this way. And he's, my customers will hate that. And that's end of conversation. I was like, 
I want to have this conversation with not with you, not as an entrepreneur, but as a roaster. And I cannot do that. He can he doesn't have that. And I love the dude, and it will we will change it. He's coming in October. And under my spell and a big stick, I make sure that we will have that conversation. And then he if he decides to go with the same roles, I'm I have no yeah. problem with that. But then you have information why you're doing that role. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. roast diversity is so important. My last parting thought is that for roasters, right? When you think about wholesale. I know we love our light roasts in the cafe, but all your tech companies, they may say they like light roast, but they really like dark roasts. So we actually brought back, we didn't even have a dark roast up until 10 months ago, which is when we started our wholesale journey. And now our, whole, our dark roast is one of maybe second best, the second most coffee produced. Because every company who gets coffee from us gets a dark roast. Yeah. So here's a funny story. When we started Green Plantation in Slovakia, we basically were a revolution of a light roast, right? So we are the people who brought in light roast. We are like, um, people mocked us about it, joked about this, that we do lemonades and stuff yeah, yeah. like that. And we were like, nope, we're doing this. And it paid off. Now, when we saw the company, we had 50 companies doing yeah. the same kind of roast on the market, which is 5 million people. It's a tiny country. And not only that, but most people are still buying coffee yeah, somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. So I like to piss off people when I do my business. I have to stand yeah. out. And that's the best way I to do that. business. At least that's how yeah, I know to do good. business, right? So what I did, I brought back a, like a darkish roast. It was just on edge of the second crack, not going to the second crack, but on very close to edge of the second crack. And I said, if intelligentsia can bring a dark roast, I can do yeah. the same. And in 2017, we had a coffee which we called Noir, a dark. And like my parents, they loved it because a lot of people in Europe, they have this super automatic espresso mm -hmm. makers, you just press button and espresso comes out, which are very yeah. convenient. And they don't want to learn how to pull shots. They don't want to have expensive marzocos at home. And that's fair. Like my parents don't mm -hmm. care for that. But on those coffee makers, the light rose is just horrible. That's just crazy. But these noir, perfect. Yeah. And people who have these machines, they're also looking for good quality coffee, just roast it a little bit differently. And I was like, nobody's doing that, so let's try. And you know what? That was our bestseller. Everybody loved us. The same with decaf, by the way. Europeans are always like, decaf is a joke, decaf is death, all these t-shirts. And we're like, yeah, but there's Swiss water process. And there are people like me, I age, it's harder and harder to drink caffeine. If I drink espresso after three o'clock, dude, I'm not sleeping. That's given. So I drink in an evening decaf, but in order to do decaf, I have to make sure I drink the best decaf yeah. I can mm -hmm. do. So I learn how to roast it. I learn how to source it. And I'm trying to you know, work on it. So in Solaka, we did the same. I was like, let's bring in decaf and let's see what people say. So we got Swiss water process decaf. We had a special approach when it comes to roasting. We're selling a lot of it. Oh, decaf done well yeah because people they had no other choice nobody else was doing it they was making joke out of it but people were like i want coffee i cannot tolerate it i love yeah. the flavor and suddenly offering them a decaf and i like, love that huh. that's really cool yeah that's a cool story yeah. Yeah. yeah all right man thank you so much for being in this podcast i had many more questions for you but i think we can stop here maybe we can do a second part about your roasting yeah. because that's also interesting before we leave, I think it's just fair to tell people where they can find you. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you can find us physically. If you're going physically, then we'll talk digitally. But physically, we're in the one, caf one cafe in San Jose. Second cafe in San Jose will be open to the public in six weeks. Then we have two in Santa Clara and one in Cupertino. And they're all busy. So if you go on the weekends, please don't write a review giving us a four star. Everything was perfect, but the wait was long. Yeah, we're proud of that. So yeah, they're all really good. They all serve our full array of coffee, pastries, food, everything. And then digitally, you can find, of course, VoyagerCraftCoffee.com or on Instagram, TikTok, under the same handle or name, VoyagerCraftCoffee.com. Come by and say hello, guys. Okay, I'll put, I'll put everything in the show notes so you guys can check them out. I also started to do TikTok and a podcast is on TikTok. Let's see if you're going to tick or talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to see you in the beginning of August on our first course for a coffee shop. Enterprise. Likewise. And until then, have a good one. Thank you, Valerie.